The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. A very warm welcome, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on Rights at Risk in Asia Pacific, co-hosted by CSBR, AWID, and Musawa as collaborators on the Hours Initiative. Uh, this is the fourth in our cross-regional webinar series discussing global and regional trends in the rise of anti-rights actors and their impacts on human rights and gender justice. My name is Rima Athar and I coordinate the Coalition for Sexual and Bodily Rights in Muslim Societies. Um, I'm an activist with roots in Pakistan and connections to feminist organizing the world over, but a lot of the work currently being done with CSBR is <clears throat> movement building on women's rights, queer rights, and trans rights with activists in Asia Pacific. So this webinar is particularly close to my heart, and I am honored to be here as the chair to facilitate this conversation with our three distinguished panelists that I will introduce to the audience now. We have uh, Rosanna Issa from Malaysia. Rosanna joined the Malaysian women's rights movement in 1999, working to address violence against women. This exposed her to challenges women face to have their rights recognized and exercised in a context of Islamization within a democratic nation with parallel legal systems. So where gender, ethnic, and religious diversities are celebrated in society and yet negated at different levels of policies and laws. She currently serves as the executive director for Sisters in Islam, an NGO working on women's rights within the framework of Islam. So welcome, Rosanna. Thank you so much for being here. We're also joined by Christina Palabay, the Secretary General of Karapatan, an alliance of individuals, groups, and organizations working to promote and protect human rights in the Philippines. She is also a member of an organizing committee for the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law, and Development, an advisor to the Urgent Action Fund for Women's Rights, and Karapatan's representative on international groups such as Frontline Defenders, a global campaign to stop the killing of human rights defenders. Chayana Kasha is with us as our third speaker from India. She is an activist at heart, a physicist by training, and a teacher by choice. She has an active member, has been an active member of two autonomous voluntary collectives in Mumbai, Forum Against Oppression of Women and Labia, a queer feminist LBT collective and national organization, People's Union for Civil Liberties. She has campaigned, researched, and taught and written on the politics of population control and reproductive technologies feminist studies of science, and sexuality and sexual rights. Thank you all so much for being here. Before we get into the conversation today, I'd like to share a little bit of a background with the audience uh, about what brought us here for this webinar. The starting point for the webinar series is actually a landmark report that came out in 2017 called Rights at Risk, the first trends report for the Observatory on the Universality of Rights, also known as the Hours Initiative. Ours is a multi-organizational feminist initiative working to monitor, analyze, and resist anti-rights agendas at the international level. It's currently coordinated by AWID and made up of 15 organizations and individual experts, including Masawa and CSBR. I think, you know, what's exciting as a member of the initiative is that it has grown out of the work that all of us have been doing to resist fundamentalisms over the last few decades, and the coming together of us from different vantage points to strengthen our collective strategies and individual work. So for example, the ways in which CSBR has tried to build feminist knowledge and critical analysis, connecting activists across countries and regions and thematic issues, really trying to build bridges across gender-based violence, sexual and reproductive health rights, LGBT issues, and interfaith work so that we better collectively respond to realize sexual and bodily autonomy for all. Masawa is a global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family. It brings together activists, poly policymakers, religious scholars to build new knowledge-based discourses that challenge the way Islam is being used to justify discrimination against women in law and practice. Masawa really builds its claim to gender equality and arguments for reform using a holistic approach, combining Islamic teachings, international human rights standards, national laws and constitutional guarantees of equality and non-discrimination, and the lived realities of women and men. And for AWID, this has grown out of the Challenging Fundamentalisms program, which began over a decade ago. AWID has recently, as part of their new strategic plan, shifted to taking a more explicit focus on fascisms and fundamentalisms, addressing them as a global interconnected phenomena that both actively collude and reinforce each other in different ways. And 
through that process, shifting towards understanding even more of the intersections between the work on fascisms and fundamentalisms and economic justice and how the neoliberal frameworks within which we operate impact and fuel some of these trends. So that has brought us together today and the informed the analysis through which the hours program is running. And in the first rights at risk report, I want to share a few of the main findings that we saw. In effect, there is a global anti-rights lobby at play, which is very large and complex. Um, regardless of how these actors position themselves and their labels, they are operating with increased resources, support, and impact. They are extremely well coordinated across borders, across different issues, religious traditions, and from the local level all the way up to the international spheres. They have an evolving repertoire of strategies, and one thing that struck us in particular is the strong trend of co-opting language and the concepts of human rights and social justice to further oppressive agendas. I think something that might be familiar to the audience members, the way this has played out is, for example, the protection of the family argument, which has gained traction globally and has popped up in many different contexts. And apart from simply the language that's being used there, I think what we're noticing is that that is an attempt to inscribe the protections that are due to individuals, individual human rights, onto institutions that can hold within them oppressive power structures that deny people's individual rights. So this is something that we're working to sort of counter and to analyze and expose. And generally, there is just a chipping away at the content and structure of our human rights agreements, whether that is trying to roll back things that have been in place for 20 years, whether that is coming up with new language to undermine that system. And the consequences for this, for human rights and gender justice, are very large. You can find the Rights at Risk report on the website, which is www.ourspplatform.org, ourspplatform.org, if you would like to read it in full. And after that report came out, we wanted to further expand our understanding of the iterative process that connects what's happening nationally and regionally to international agendas. And so through the webinar series, connecting with national level activists to provide us much more detail and specifics and nuances of what's happening. In Asia Pacific, I think there's a lot of work to be done regionally to strengthen human rights mechanisms and the ratification and implementation of these human rights laws, whether this is, you know, the reservations we've seen on the basis of claims to traditional values or religion and culture or increasingly arguments of national sovereignty that just say human rights don't belong here or they don't belong to certain subsets of people. And apart from that, we are seeing how this is sort of bolstered by a multiplicity of tactics to suppress dissent and advance oppressive agendas on a daily basis, which includes, you know, taking over public opinion through targeted criminalization, through active campaigns of misinformation and cyber insecurity, through threats of violence, to further erode, you know, rights and protections for the most marginalized, including indigenous communities, racial and ethnic minorities, people who depend on the land, LGBT people, women and girls. So through this webinar, we want to go deeper and to better understand the political economy around this. What are the tactics? Whose interests are being served and how? And in the face of that assault on fundamental freedoms and dignity for all, what can we learn from the incredible work that is being done on the ground by people's movements? Uh, the shape of resistance in progress and how that can be supported and amplified through interconnected strategies and collective action. And really to ground that in the current political moment. If this is different from the struggles that we've seen previously, which we believe that it is, what has changed? And therefore, how can we develop stronger methods so that we're not just building on where we've come from, but moving ourselves to bring into focus the realities of the world we want to live in now? So with that, I would like to open the discussion to our speakers. Um, a point of order, as participants, you are all muted so that we can carry the conversation over the platform, but please do introduce yourself and ask questions in the chat box, and I will pose them to the speakers. Please continue the discussion as well on social media using the hashtag rights at risk, and we will monitor that and bring that in as we can. In terms of the flow of the conversation, I'm gonna pose a question to each of our panelists. They will each have 10 minutes to respond, and then we'll have some discussion, and then we'll have a second round and close again with a final discussion. So Rosanna, I would love to turn to you now and open with you. 
So from your vantage point in Malaysia and your work with CIS, can you share with us what is the picture of anti-rights uh, trends in your country? What has changed and who are the players and what are their strategies? And specifically, what impact do you see this having on women's human rights organizing and civil society organizing? Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rima, for the introduction. Um, so, yes, I mean, uh, largely, I think, um, so Malaysia had gained independence um, from the British in 1957. And for 61 years, you know, we've been only under uh, one particular regime, um, you know, uh, that really came across as, you know, uh, a, a political party that was, uh, political parties that are really, um, moderate because um, at the cusp of independence, you know, there was uh, this picture of hope, of harmony, of sense of being together to build the nation. Um, you know, Malaysia is a country that is, you know, multi ethnic, multi religious, and multicultural. Um, and uh, there is this overall sense of uh, oneness um, and, and uh, uh, a shared identity uh, that was quite uh, prevalent. And in fact, it's quite uh, nostalgic uh, for, for us in these days um, where we're experiencing uh, Islamization and extremism um, in multiple levels, at multiple levels. So um, in relation to Islamization uh, in, in Malaysia, there's a revivalism of Islam since the 1970s uh, through the um, students and youth movement. Um, which really led then, you know, to um, uh, the establishment of political Islam um, and uh, the, 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 the ideological, um, 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 uh, the ideologies of Islam then, you know, um, uh, embedded within political parties as well that wanted to establish the Islamic State and uh, the hooded laws. And um, at one point, you know, it was very stark where you can sense like within the ruling parties and the opposition Islamist parties, you know, they, they were very, very diverse and different. Um, because, you know, on the one hand, um, the, the ruling uh, uh, coalition, you know, was very much uh, moderate in nature. Uh, there, there's recognition of Islam, but a moderate kind of Islam that is tolerant, that is open, um, that uh, um, practices liberalism as well as pluralism. But towards um, this um, ideological and political Islam, uh, there was, you know, this com competition, you know, to win the, the, the majority Malay Muslim vote bank. And since then, you know, within the uh, in the 1980s, uh, there have all also been, you know, the bureaucratization of Islam through the structures and the systems, the establishment of the international Islamic universities, uh, establishment of the Islamic banking, uh, laws and policies that are, you know, taking into account, you know, as, uh, sources um, from Islam, um, making, you know, fatwas uh, to have the force of law. Um, and um, increasingly over the years, within the last 30 years, um, there have been institutions, um, Islamic institutions or institutions in the name of Islam that have been created and are also enriched with all, all kinds of resources. Um, however, you know, the call for uh, accountability is uh, either none or minimal. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, there's also uh, the expansion of uh, enforcement powers um, uh, to enforcement agencies. Uh, while, you know, they have limited powers, at the same time, they are buttressed by enforcement agencies at the federal lab level. Um, so, um, the uh, at one point, we, we, we've always had the Sharia criminal offences enactment, you know, that had uh, laws like, um, 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 you know, it's a violation to be in close proximity just between uh, a man and a woman. Um, you know, there have been all kinds of, um, you know, like laws as well that um, uh, would uh, penalize, for example, you know, eating within Ramadan, uh, in the month of Ramadan. But all of these have never actually been enforced, you know, uh, and at the very, at the ve at most, you know, uh, if people are caught for these offenses, they would be um, sent for counseling they would not actually undergo the punishments that are attributed within these laws, which is limited, but still, uh, there, there, there are punishments at the end of the day um, that um, 
you know, uh, the, the punishments are to the extent of either um, three years uh, maximum uh, imprisonment, um, 5,000 ringgit fine, which is about 1,200 uh, US dollars, and uh, six lashes. Um, over the years as well, in terms of society, um, when we look at the span of um, the, the 61 years, um, uh, there have been a lot of shifts, you know, in tolerance. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, our society used to be very tolerant, very accepting uh, of diversity and differences, uh, even in terms of expressions of different uh, sexualities and gender identities. Uh, but right now, you know, you, you can see that, you know, there's uh, 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 intolerance, rejection, as well as violence. Yeah, that affects women and LGBT communities, uh, and this also affects you know their rights within the public uh, realm as well. So at one point where we actually had public healthcare provision on family planning services, abortion, and sex reassignment surgeries uh, within the 1980s, th these were um, uh, uh, taken away or withdrawn. Um, also in relation to you know our culture and heritage so different, uh, there's been a negation and replacement um, of our diversity. Uh, increasingly, it's been Arabized in relation to dress, the language, and um, any kinds of um, multiculturalism, uh, inter-ethnic kind of um, 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 diversity within a particular culture um, is rejected. Uh, and so what has uh, what used to be inclusive and multicultural uh, has now become sanitized. Um, so it's moving towards a culture that is very much exclusive. Um, and there's this sense of, you know, superiority in terms of, you know, the identification of how we come across as the pure and authentic Islam. Uh, our education system uh, has also been severely compromised in relation to our language, um, the curriculum itself, and you know uh, there's there's been a lot of oppression towards uh, the students' movement in relation to their political expressions and participation. Um, identity politics has also been a, 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 a huge um, factor. Um, Why once upon a time, you know, we are actually much more um, freer in the way we express ourselves in terms of our dress and how we define modesty. Um, so this is definitely, there's a lot more uh, covering up of women um, and it permeates uh, through the public spaces and its influences as well through the education system because, you know, this is how um, uh, the uh, recruitment or, or systematic recruitment, monitoring and strengthening through the cadership, through the Islamist groups, uh, ensuring that, you know, women's mobility, their expressions, are all actually uh, must conform to a particular kind of expression of Islam that is accepted. Um, within the pop culture and entertainment industry as well, you know, uh, Islam has also um, uh, culturally has affected uh, the entertainment industry. There's a lot of uh, more covering up of women right now. Uh, there's also TV stations that specifically uh, focus on uh, religious uh, Islam content and in a way it affects as well those coming into the industries you know to shape and express themselves in a certain way because for them it's their bread and butter and this is how you know um, the rule says you have to cover up in order for me to get a job then that's what they will have to do so there's very little resistance um, and of course, you know, so the, 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 in the era of, you know, celebrity, international artists, social media influences. So these are actually um, the influences towards uh, the, um, the um, public and the, the, the young girls and the women who look at, you know, how Islam is supposed to be practiced and, um, um, and expressed, you know, is very much limited. Um, and uh, the diversity uh, has definitely uh, uh, regressed. Um, I'm just going to go through very quickly in terms of um, um, uh, who are the players, you know, so one, once upon a time the players, you know, the people that we have to deal with are actually within the political parties or the government. But right now, you know, I called, you know, over the years through the uh, culture, uh, uh, you know, to what extent Islam has been embedded and I call it Islam Embedded 4.0. Um, 
permeated through the public sector, the private sector. So um, those who are Islamists are no longer those that you identify in the past who are, you know, the bearded and the turban. Uh, they are actually um, professionals. They're middle class. They have a clean clean image, they're polite, they're rational, they're sophisticated, they use the human rights language, they get onto the human rights platform, and, uh, and this is where, you know, they are actually arguing uh, for the Islamist agenda through um, the legitimacy of uh, liberalism and democratic means. Uh, at the same time, they are critical of liberalism as well. But um, me uh, 2018, there's been a change of new government after 61 years um, of decadent and extremely um, corrupt rule. So there's a lot of possibilities for reform. We are all very excited. But at the same time, you know, we have to, in, in the midst of all this modernity that's uh, happened um, um, and, and the progress that has happened, uh, you know, going to the 21st century when it comes to women's rights and after 24 years of ratification of the CEDAW, uh, we still have child marriage, FGM, unilateral conversion of minors, inequality with men and us, and uh, inequality of Muslim women uh, with men and non-Muslim women. Um, they still do not have rights in relation to guardianship of children, inheritance laws. They are still required to be obedient to their husbands. That's the narrative that's out there. And under the Islamist party um, of post-elections, you know, two women and in fact actually four women have been sentenced uh, to caning uh, for the attempt of lesbian sex and sex works. Um, there has been death of transgender women and on top of that the work, uh, any progressive voices uh, you know that are speaking out against this uh, oppression um, of the use of Islam against women and marginalized communities, they are actually penalized. So on the one hand you know uh, there's, there's a certain form of progress, but at the same time, when it comes to women's rights, we feel that we are still, you know, like 24 years left behind. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll end here. Thank you, Rosanna, so much for that. I think one of the things that struck me uh, as you were speaking about that is um, the tactic around the appearance of being soft, right? The appearance of being moderate, the appearance of saying that, well, these punishments aren't so bad, you know? We're not really subjecting people to a denial of their rights. This is not really actually a, a, you know, a lack of dignity, but that is actually what's happening. Um, and I think that you've sort of sketched this very broad and slightly disturbing picture of the infiltration um, of these ideas and so, you know, through that public discourse, but what you're sharing with us from Malaysia is like, it's in the educational systems, it is in the financial systems, it's all of these overarching structures that really shape our society that has sort of you have to engage with on those multiple levels. And then also, I think this narrative of supremacy you brought in that's coming out around racial supremacy and religious supremacy and how that is imposed uh, on historically marginalized communities. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Tayanika, I wanted to come to you next. Uh, same question, if you can sort of share with us the landscape in India and if you're seeing also similar trends uh, popping up or what are the, or different ones as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Rima, for having me here, and thanks, Rosanna, for setting the tone like that, because I almost have a premonition that this is what we're going to see in India a few years hence. I mean, we're in the process of becoming what you are emerging out of. So I just give a little bit, bit of history in the sense that since we are independent of the British for now 71 years, and we had, luckily for us, a constitution and a government, much like what you say, of a feeling of being a nation together, a multicultural nation, multi-religious nation, which also committed to principles of equality, justice, secularism, socialism, uh, which kind of pulled us through for many years, which took care of the many hierarchies that existed in Indian society. Uh, and one of the major ones being those of caste, uh, which is something that we all live with, whatever religion we come from. So we live in a very hierarchicalized world, a very patriarchal world. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it's imbibed within us. So while we take a democratic notion of individual rights and equality, uh, in social living, there is hierarchy that is inbuilt and a feudal substructure which, which informs most of our interactions in civil society. So having said that, the fact that we had a constitution and we had rights written, written within the constitution, for those from the margins, affirmative action written into the constitution, 
uh, rights for women, equal rights for women built into the independent country and notion of rights for women right from the beginning. Uh, there was, I can, I can say that there are from certain sections of society, definitely these, these made a difference to people. So the kind of uh, privileges that women from upper caste and maybe upper classes or middle classes got because of this background, we find that there is a very vocal women's voice that exists. At the same time, because of reservations in employment and education that existed for those from the marginalized caste, we see today, 70, 70 years later, second generation, which is at least having some space to be present in the public system of being educated, of being in some sort of government jobs, which otherwise would have never been possible for them. So we are at a point when some of the benefits of that have seeped in. But at the same time, from the 90s, we see very disturbing trends. Uh, and now we can look back the last 30 years and almost see what is happening. Uh, both the trends of the neoliberal globalization as well as a rising fundamentalism around religion and a majoritarian culture which seems to take hold simultaneously from the 90s. And today you can see how they're connected with each other. Then they seem like two parallel trends happening together. Uh, so what, what I see is that a move from a socialist welfare state to a completely market-oriented and a policing state. That is very evident now in the last 30 years, which means that there's drying up of public resources. There's increased privatization of most services that people need. So education seems to be moving towards privatization. Health seems to be moving towards privatization. Uh, there is no systems of social security that are set in. There's constant checking of subsidies for agriculture. And you see the impact of that on small farmers, on small landholders. Uh, and you see a rising trend of farmer suicides and rising trend of um, the rural sector completely going into bankruptcy of different kinds. And the final thing that we saw this Monday when the Oxfam report came out that you have today nine Indians owning 50% of the country's wealth. Uh, so the difference between the, the classes has become stark, has become very, very, very evident. And this is a trend of the shift that we are seeing all around us. Mm, so along with that is the feudal society. So you have a division of class, but also there's a division of caste. And most of the times, these go together. So those from the margins do not obviously get the benefit of class, do not come in these rich classes that are emerging. They are more from the more dominant caste. Uh, and, and what is happening now is because of the more articulate voices of those and resistance of those from the marginalized caste, that there is more active repression as well. Um, and what we saw in the last few years, and I'll come more in detail for the last five years, but uh, a rising incidence of violence against Dalits, which is the marginalized caste, uh, in different places across the country. Uh, one of the ways in which it plays out is in the resistance to inter-caste marriages. Uh, inter-caste marriages have been granted in the constitution. Anybody can get married. Any man can get married to any woman, irrespective of the caste background, irrespective of religion. But we continuously see this as a major point of tension and a major point of conflict across the country. So you find uh, honor, what are called honor killings, but are actually murders of family members because they have engaged in these kinds of relationships, whether it is across caste or whether it is across religion. The, so the religion is the other thing that although Hinduism, I mean, you say that the Islam that's practiced in Malaysia is taking a face of being liberal. I think Hinduism passes off as a liberal and tolerant religion while keeping the most violent institution of caste intact. So it doesn't appear in the world. And there are not many countries that are Hindu in this in this world to then see what is the real character of Hinduism. Uh, there is a sense of tolerance in the religion that is spoken of at one level. There is no written word, there is no text to follow. And in that sense, there are many practices that can be accommodated within Hinduism. But what we are seeing emerging over the last century 
is a brand of hinduism which is very monotheistic which is getting very politicized which is getting very majoritarian and which is extremely intolerant and which we kind of uh, speak of as a politics so there is a political hinduism that is taken hold which has been there even before independence but which has become very strident today so uh, what we what i'm saying is the rise from the 90s is of the strident political cultural nationalism which is now being intolerant to not only the caste system but also being intolerant to various religious minorities uh, and the major target have been the muslims in this country because of the old story of the india pakistan divide and the maintenance of that enmity between the hindus and muslims uh, or actually nurturing of that enmity and nurturing of that violence against each other by certain forces in this country uh, which is also spilled over uh, at times to against the christians but uh, so the both these large religious minorities that exist in this country are feeling threatened at this moment by the rising and absolutely violent and absolutely uh, majoritarian hindu cultures that are happening uh, so between all of this then when you have when you look at gender and sexuality actually um, there is the market plays a very strange role because while because there is this globalization of some sorts for a certain section of people there seems to be some sort of a liberal acceptance of genders and sexualities uh, at the same time the regressiveness of the rising political and cultural nationalism pulls that away and takes it away and becomes more regressive so this is where they seem to be at odds with each other but both of them don't actually favor those that are marginalized because of gender and sexuality so the fight that as groups that are working as feminist groups as uh, queer groups that work in this country the fight against the market and the fight against the hindu right wing both these fights become distinct but both of them are present all the time in our lives so i i think that this is the trend that we are seeing over a period of time uh, to come more specifically to the recent past of so the last 5 years um in 2014 india elected uh, the hindu right wing party into power and in the last 5 years we can see many of the things that you spoke rozana Uh, repression on students very wide scale uh, taking away and changing syllabi very wide scale changing many things in this country's cultures uh, destroying public institutions destroying taking over of the media by the corporates and by the state completely so we do not have much of independent media anymore in this country uh, influencing of the court and the judiciary which seems to be the last space where battles could be fought that you had the constitution and you had the law and you could go and fight there but you find that that is also a shrinking space so while the supreme court can give us many excellent judgments whether it is on the decriminalization of homosexuality whether it is on granting transgender people rights whether it is on privacy it is on entry of women into temples on muslim women's rights to triple talaq it keeps interpreting constitutional morality constitutional principles and giving us the, these rights on the one hand but when it comes to uh, battles around displacement battles around large projects battles around corporate power battles around surveillance systems battles around uh, any kind of basic human rights which are continuously being violated to find the supreme court as as um, as not moving as the state itself or being as backward and as regressive as the state and not restricting itself to constitutional principles at that point so the the battle hence is very complicated right now uh, what what is also being seen in the last 10 years 10 years is an increase in the conversation amongst people on the issues of sexual violence so if you if i may say that the 1980s women's movement which is what we have many of us are part of that the women's movements that began in the 1980s started off with talking about sexual violence uh, those discussions happened in very very small groups and very very small spaces they have influenced law and policy over the last 30 40 years but what we are seeing in the last 10 years is a lot of response 
of all kinds to incidents of sexual violence and they happen in many ways so it may be the right wing which will use an incident of sexual violence or an implied incident of sexual violence to trigger a riot like situation to trigger violence against the other that could be one it is in one the in the very famous case of 2012 of the violence and rape and murder of this woman jyoti singh in delhi uh, that there was really people coming out onto the streets and all kinds of people coming out onto the streets protesting sexual violence and that that was some that is a moment that is very significant because there are a lot of young people women men and everyone coming out to say that this violence is not okay and what we are seeing again in me too now uh, and the last round that's happening that there are many voices that are wanting to speak of sexual violence both from a feminist point of view as well as from a regressive point of view so that's become one um, current debate that is going on all the time the other one that is happening yeah i just finished yeah so so this this i think that what is what we are battling mainly against today is the derailment of the fabric of socialism secularism and democracy itself and that is what we are trying to protect and that is what seems to be at risk thank you thank you so much shayanaka um just to add in i mean i thank you so much for bringing in the angle of market fundamentalisms into this conversation right and the ways in which that impacts uh securitization uh policing of civil liberties and the ways in which we need as movements to come together across these issues and understand those connections much more deeply i think you've shared as well so much progress has been made through the court system uh through democratic institutions that do exist but it's similarly there's slow eroding of the capacity of that to really impact some of these structures that have said up until now don't touch us because we're sort of growing growth and and wellness apparently for the for for your country um well doing that on the backs of the most marginalized people. So thank you so much for that. Christina, I want to come now to you um and see if you can also share with us what's happening in the Philippines right now um and how some of this is playing out there. Thank you. Uh oh, thank you to Rosana and Chanika for presenting a a uh, quick but uh, clear picture of uh, what is happening in their respective countries. I guess it's not uh, so much different, no, from the Philippines um rising from being a country that rose from the ashes of uh, of the American and uh the Spanish colonial uh, periods here in this part of uh Southeast Asia. Uh but mainly since since that era what we uh what we are unpacking right now is the greater sense of a uh, false democracy that exists hmm, here in the Philippines uh, even after those colonial um uh, periods are past you know uh, the, the 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 economic and political situation uh despite uh the uh, latching off from the chains of those uh colonial masters of the country would show that uh the country remains underdeveloped uh it is largely feudal believe it or not uh uh farmers are still being lashed by uh their feudal lords here you know as in 100 years ago um carabaos uh are still being used for agricultural production and when you compare it to uh, other countries even the uh, neighboring countries of of the philippines here in southeast asia this is really um uh uh a different no a backward picture of so it shows a backward picture of our agricultural uh economy and uh, this also shows how uh a patriarchal setting has um contributed no or has been part uh partly as a result of that kind of economy that has existed uh post colonial period here um and at the same time it also shows the kind of politics and the polit the political system that exists here uh which we there there are semblance of there are semblances of uh democracy uh elections are going on um institutions of courts uh the three branches of government uh of government exists no but what practically 
um, makes uh, our current political system um, uh, uh, go, go on are what we call the three Gs, you know, the guns, still the guns, guns, and the gold. You know, because uh, the, the landlords and the rich businessmen, the local rich businessmen still dominate uh, the political landscape here. They get elected into parliament. Uh, they get appointed to um, uh, executive posts. They have um, a court system uh, with um, with their appointees in their pockets, um, and 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 this shows the the recent trends that we have seen in the past ten to twenty years here in the Philippines. One is uh, the constant uh economic crisis no that uh spurs uh economic injustice for many many years no and uh in the past 20 years the uh the the the, the country's economic managers have uh, really uh embraced uh the concept the, the framework of uh, neoliberal market policies uh which has brought forth increased um uh, effects or impact of uh, inflation. Um, ta the taxation uh, system has um, uh, regressed, has, has adopted a regressive approach. The wage gap between women and uh, men workers have uh, gone far wider. Uh, there is uh, increasing lack of social protection among uh, workers, both men and women. Uh, we are facing right now one of the worst a uh, jobs crisis uh, that we call because of uh, the uh, job contraction, um, the loss of uh, more than a hundred uh, a million uh, jobs uh, since 2006, you know, and the majority of these jobs are um, of, of those rendered jobless are women. Um, there are about more than six thousand uh, Filipinos. 50% of them are women who leave the country every day, huh? every day. So uh, the uh, when in other uh, in other uh, contexts, um, um, there there are other driving forces where people go out and uh, you know you migrate to other places. But what we have mostly are economic migrants, no. Uh, more than 10 million Filipinos are outside the country. Um, this constant economic crisis um, is uh, what we call uh, the bedrock of the rise of tyrants you know, here in the Philippines. Uh, 50 years, 30 years ago, we booted out a president uh, who has um, unleashed martial rule or the military dictatorship here in the Philippines. But we are, what we are now seeing, especially with the presidency of um, Rodrigo Duterte, uh, the strongman uh, rule has um, descended once again, uh, not because the people wanted to be ruled by such a, a hideous character, <laughs> uh, but uh, but simply, probably because of the failure of uh, governments who, or, or administrations who put up a democratic facade, you know, despite uh, its continuing, uh, this, this governments or this political parties continuing promotion of uh, the false sense of democracy that we have here in the Philippines. And secondly, the distortion of uh, human rights uh, concepts. You know? which uh, almost all uh, political parties are guilty of um, in not only Duterte, no? but other political parties before him have, uh, has been doing. And this also um, points to a trend of distortion of uh, the concepts on women's rights. No? Um, the, the, we have a vibrant civil society here in the Philippines, a bi vibrant people's movement, a vibrant women's movement. But uh, I guess we're, we're back to where we started, you know, as we would say here, you know, because um, despite the enactment of so many laws on human rights and women's rights, it seems that these are all being um, 
uh, pushed under the drain because of the current uh, backlash no, on civil society in all aspects. No? Um, I think lastly, the, the, the trend of the impact of the culture of impunity is really hitting hard, you know, especially on women human rights defenders, uh, because we are now facing what we call uh, the full-scale uh, attack you know, on, on people's and women's movements here in the field, or full-scale, meaning there are um, forms of attacks by the state, through extrajudicial killings, um, criminalization of, of uh, activists, you know, uh, uh, vilification of uh, the opposition as uh, terrorists or criminals, or even drug addicts, or uh, supporters of, of uh, drug syndicates, because Duterte wants to really promote his drug war and get away, what well, he wants to get away with it. Um, at the same time, um, corporations, uh, well, lar a large part of our territories, uh, our lands and resources are being um, uh, opened up you know, through, a, through many attempts for, a co for constitutional change, for uh, uh, full ownership, full ownership of uh, foreign corporations. Uh, so uh, there are there's an increasing number of mining corporations that come in. Um, the number of uh, plantation, agricultural plantations uh, have uh, been dominating the agricultural sector for the last 10 years. And uh, at the end of it all, what we're seeing is uh, the, um, the chipping away of, of the hard fought um, gains that we had. As a, as a people, as a civil society, as a people's movement. Um, and uh, of course, it, it pushes us to reflect more you know, on how things have uh, been done you know, in terms of um, pushing forward uh, the reform agenda on how we view social change you know, and how social movements should work around this kind of uh, renew of, of what we call... Um, the situation of uh, new strong men you know, like Duterte here in the Philippines. So um, as for women, um, there is, uh, well, our president curses on women every day, <laughs> practically every day. So um, the, the normalization of uh, sexual violence and abuse is done, no, non, done by none other than our president. So what we see is uh, how this is um, being um, this is being adopted as a practice you know, even by communities where we have made headways in terms of uh, promoting women's rights you know, um, in media in in educational institutions in in grassroots rural and indigenous communities so um, um, it's 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 uh, it will. We know that it's a hard. Uh, it will still be a a, a hard uh, a struggle. You know? But um, I guess uh, what is also clear in our history is that um, uh, the various people's movements and women's movements have faced peoples like or tyrants like Duterte, and uh, I guess uh, we have to. Uh, we have a lot of things to do you know, to build this kind of resistance. Thank you so much, Christina. I think uh, just briefly what you've brought into the conversation that strikes me as really important is, is, is this, I, I like this term you're saying, the sense of false democracy that seems to be common, frankly, across all of these contexts and the sort of puppetry and theater uh, that's happening to pretend uh, that we are using these institutions or, or that they frankly are capturing these sort of processes to further these regressive agendas. I think also the question of forced migration and displacement that you have struck upon is incredibly important for us to think through how to address and the ways in which this is all seems to be underpinned very deeply by a constant sense of economic crisis and insecurity that is sort of fueled a narrative that fuels that in real life 
actions that fueled that and that gendered impacts of that are enormous. Um, and I think also sort of the, the lack of accountability. How do we address these kinds of systems when we're seeing the repression and the violence happening without any link to the democratic institutions that we have. Thank you all so much for that first round. Um, I'm gonna bring in questions from the audience now. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes for this. Um, we have a question from Vimala. Um, to what extent, I think this is to all the panelists, are these changes influenced by certain groups who hold military, economic, and legal power, or is this a result of support from the constituent, which some of you have touched on but could maybe go deeper into? Particularly um, for Chayanaka, does Hinduism influence the legal structure in India in a way that is similar to Malaysia? Oh, this is both of you. Uh, for example, Sharia laws applicable to Muslims, Fatwa Council, etc. And then also to Chayanaka, if you could expand a bit on your opinion of Me Too uh, in India that you brought up in the context of rights at risk and what that means. And one uh, last comment as well is that the trends uh, are very similar across the countries, institutions ruled by the rich and old hierarchies. And um, Ro Rocio Albertos is sharing that this is seen similarly in Europe as well. Um, and the question is about what can we do to change this and is civil society strong enough? We will go into that question uh, after. So if you can just address the first uh, set of questions. Chayanaka, okay. you want to start? Yeah. yeah. Um, so as far as the law in India goes, uh, only family laws are governed by religion. And that is something that has been kept as a burning issue in the country all along. Uh, it was kept like that because it was a, it was kind of an assurance to the minority community, especially the Christians and the Muslims, that they will not be made into Hindu citizens of uh, independent India. And so the laws governing marriage, family, etc. are only the ones that are influenced by religion. There are four different laws for Hindus, which covers everybody, that is the Sikh part. Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, all of them come under Hindus, the Muslims, uh, the Christians, and the Parsis. So there are four different laws governed by religion. Otherwise, all laws in the country are uh, secular. They do not, they're not based on religion at all. But these are, and this is something that the Hindu right wing keeps using to say that um, we will get a uniform law for the country. Uniform civil code is something that was assured as a directive principle in the constitution. And that's constantly been thrown as a thing that we will now change all laws, make them one law for family. And that will be a law that will be a Hindu law. That's the narrative that the right wing Hindu is building. Whereas what the women's groups have been asking for is gender just laws for everybody. So that's a separate debate, which I'm not going in here. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is that the powers here are definitely the corporates and they are very much the very fundamentalist groups that exist in these societies, uh, which are organizing themselves in a very, um, in a manner that they gain strength and they spread lies. And that's the manner of actually gaining control through the insecurities of people by forcing identity politics of the nature that you are Hindus and so all Hindus should come together. There is nothing that combines all Hindus together. So, yeah. Rosanna, Christina. Hi, uh, shall I go first? All right, um, okay. So um, in relation to the question in terms of, you know, what kind of uh, power that actually uh, has a stronghold uh, and, and what led to, you know, the trends uh, towards um, the conservative uh, expressions of uh, Islam. I mean, I think um, definitely in the context of Malaysia, I think uh, it definitely came from both uh, the top and the bottom. So definitely the uh, political power um, um, and, and, and the, the struggle for the uh, for the vote bank uh, had definitely uh, led to, you know, um, the political parties um, uh, doing this uh, competing of out-Islamizing uh, one uh, another. Uh, at the same time, you know, there, there was already that 
movement uh, that came from the ground, from within the students and the youth uh, towards, you know, the, the, the practice of uh, Islam that is more authentic, uh, that, that came from, um, you know, other expressions of um, um, Islam, um, which really then led to the way how uh, we had uh, always understood and practiced Islam uh, to be, you know, very inclusive, uh, very uh, uh, plural, very uh, accepting of uh, diversity, um, that certainly had been eroded. Um, and that came also as well from the, uh, I think so, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the, the economic um, uh, play, you know, in relation to, uh, to what extent, because even though the Malay Muslims are a majority uh, in Malaysia, uh, they, they comprise 60% of the population. However, uh, they do not have uh, the economic power. So, in fact, uh, there had be there had um, there had to be affirmative action uh, to uh, help the Malay out of poverty. And unfortunately, this affirmative action that is meant to be temporary has kind of like turned into something that is uh, more permanent. Um, um, and the Malays are actually defending this to say that it's actually a Malay privilege. And when it, it comes to challenging this Malay privilege, uh, they bring uh, the whole uh, identity of something. Uh, the narrative of, you know, the Muslims. Therefore, to protect Islam, to protect the Malays, and therefore, um, I think this is where this is where we had uh, that struggle, um, in, 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 and it's really difficult to undo because I think uh, the way Islam uh, has been embedded within our society has been a very slow process. But because it has been very slow, that came from the bottom is actually much, much more difficult to undo. Thank you, Rosanna. Uh, Christina, before you answer, just one more question specifically to you as well. Um, after the war on drugs, has the president proved his competency as the leader of the country in preserving the human rights in the Philippines? Mm -hmm. um, well, first and foremost, uh, the, the, the changes uh, in the past years, uh, if we call it change, you know, um, are based mainly on class-based interests. You know? So. Um, not we we may be uh, the largest Catholic uh, country in in the Philippines, uh, and we may have a a uh, quite a big uh, quite a population of uh, Muslims down in the south, but um, most of the um, state of most of policies uh, and uh, and uh, the the way. Uh, those in power govern are influenced, but by their interests, uh, interests in in um, attaining wealth and power and uh, perpetuating this through their families no, or their political clans. So, what pretty much exists uh, and what influenced these changes are the, on one hand those who uphold uh, or those families, big political clans who have dominated the political landscape, who came from big business and um, landlords in the Philippines. Secondly, it's, it's influenced, the changes are influenced by um, the, uh, what we call uh, domi more dominant powers outside the country. The U.S. has still quite a hold on on the economic and the political aspects of the uh, uh, our political and economic uh, structures, but at the same time, China has also been increasingly um, finding its way into uh, the political and economic fabric of uh, the country. You know? um, but of course, uh, what also is an influence is, uh, as I said, the, the uh, forms of resistance by various movements through through time you know? so those definitely impact on uh, the, the the current situation that we are in now in terms of uh, the war on drugs 
uh, that is precisely what our president would like to believe, no? that he has become, uh, uh, and that's, that's what he says, no? that he's protecting human rights by uh, his war on drugs, by killing people, by killing the drug addicts. No? But that is the kind of narrative that, um, that I think does not only exist in the Philippines, but in other parts of, of the world as well, that when strong men would want to um, further um, such repressive policies, they often use language to um, to make it more palatable, to make it really palatable to a large part of the constituents, and uh, especially to the middle class, no, whom he really plays into, um, citing reasons of uh, peace and order, security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what is most impacted with the Philippi with the with uh, Philippine President Duterte's war on drugs uh, has, has has been constantly uh, portrayed in uh, the media is the impact on the poor, and sometimes impact the impact on women the impacts on women are largely invisibilized, no? especially on the widows, on the women killed in the drug war, uh, on the girls who were displaced or or or, or brought as orphans, no? and so I can never really say that. This is the kind of um, uh, campaign against uh, illegal the illegal drug trade that we want. Thank you so much for that. I think there's so much happening, uh, and so many of these uh, sort of the rhetoric that's coming out, the violence, the land grabbing, the big business interests, as well as sort of geopolitical concerns, right? So US and China and the competition at that level, which I think we are seeing all over uh, this region very hard, uh, constantly across different contexts. Um, I think for now, though, what I'd like to do is move us uh, with this sort of landscape and this picture that we have painted into sort of the second part uh, of the webinar, which is to sort of take what we've heard and then also to address the question which some of you have already started to do and we've had some questions from the audience as well about what are the strategies of resistance uh, that we are seeing um, I think very specifically like if if there are case studies of uh, certain things that have come up um, in the work of yourself or your networks and those around you um, what have the challenges been and how have those been overcome and how do you think that we can continue to strengthen collective resistance to the rise of these anti-rights actors? Not only you know, in your own individual context, but from the links that we're seeing across these uh, settings to sort of develop stronger collective action moving forward. And specifically, I think, on the co-optation of language and around rhetoric, this is a question from the audience as well, but I'd like to tie it in. Um, what are the tactics we can use to challenge that and to call that out so that that public discourse and awareness is really shifted? Um, so I'd like to open this question um, to Rosanna. Hi, okay, sorry, I'm struggling with all these buttons, uh, very uh, sophisticated. Um, yeah, I mean, so in relation to what's been happening in Malaysia within the context of um, the work of Sisters in Islam, you know, it really, you know, is all about, you know, women coming together, um, you know, discovering the Quran for themselves, you know, finding out uh, what, what the Quran has to say about women's rights. Um, and really then claiming that authority to speak about Islam, to speak about women's rights, and to do so publicly, uh, especially uh, in relation to the fact that how Islam is being taught in Malaysia is definitely, uh, you know, uh, you know it, it's the ulama that have the, uh, the space and the platform to speak about it. Um, and what these eight women had, had done was really to then uh, peruse the media, and this is all, you know, prior to social media and the internet, um, and, and, you know, getting, you know, they, I think they, what they did was, you know, to come together for three years, they just held study sessions every single week, and then, you know, um, you know, uh, and at the same time, you know, collecting, you know, the, 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 the individual and, and, and collective courage um, to then come up with um, 
positions in relation to domestic violence, in relation to uh, the issues of um, equality between men and women in Islam. Um, and I think that kind of like really shook the landscape, you know, people were then really curious to know like who is the sisters in Islam, you know, and, and, and how is it that they can find the authority uh, to speak about Islam in a way that's really confident uh, and so knowledgeable. So I think um, what CIS, in terms of the success of CIS, you know, what it has been able to do is to create and build that space for public debate and discussion on Islam and to say that, you know, um, for as long as Islam is used as a source of public law and policy, then everyone in Malaysia, regardless of your ethnicity and religion, you know, you are impacted directly or indirectly. And therefore, as a citizen of Malaysia, you have a right to speak about Islam. It is not the exclusive preserve of the Islam. Um, and I think one of the, um, uh, the the approach as well in terms of um, you know dismantling uh, and claiming that authority to be able to speak about it is to differentiate between you know what is Sharia and what what is fit, uh, which is jurisprudence. You know, and and whenever we're talking about Islamic family laws, whenever we're talking about um, hooded laws, when we're, <laughs> we're talking about Sharia criminal offences laws. Ultimately, these are all man-made. I mean, they may have derived um, certain principles, but ultimately, you know, it really is about a, a group of people coming together and figuring out, you know, what these laws should be for a particular country or a particular uh, community, and therefore, um, you know, and 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 if it can be done, uh, and, and, and the idea is that it can be changed, then therefore why not, you know, we reform and change these laws to uphold equality and justice for women, for Muslim women in Malaysia. Um, and I think one of the stronghold um, um, uh, in terms of uh, the approaches to, to claim is that, you know, Islam actually within the Muslim legal tradition there is this um, recognition of the diversity of opinion. And for as long as that, we can push uh, um, this idea that, you know, diversity is out there and is always contextualized, then there's always, always a way to reform laws that will uphold the, 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 the principles of equality and justice that is required and that would meet the needs um, uh, on the ground. Um, so there, there's all the other work that we do, I think, with all the other groups, you know, as well in relation to, you know, advocacy for legal and policy reform, you know, building capacity and engagement. And uh, the, 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 the groups of people that we work in particular are women, grassroots women, um, uh, youth, and uh, we're also expanding uh, our engagement with the LGBTIQ communities in Malaysia as well. Um, and I think one of the um, success as well um, of um, the work that we've been able to do is the fact that, you know, we didn't do this alone. Um, so, you know, we've, we've uh, done this work together with other women's groups uh, who are not necessarily faith-based. They are grounded, you know, in human rights uh, and uh, within the human rights framework. So I give a shout out to all my colleagues and friends, you know, within the Joint Action Group for Gender Equality. You know, this work would not have been possible without um, all of them. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, the work of Sisters in Islam, because Sisters is the one uh, that initiated Musawa together with the, an international planning committee. Um, and, you know, the work of Musawa is so astounding, you know, it really is, I, I encourage everyone to go into the Musawa website, you know, look at the knowledge building briefs, uh, check out the language, check out the, um, the, 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 the approaches, um, and especially in relation to uh, after Musawa was launched, I think, you know, they were very specific in terms of, you know, looking at what are the verses within the Quranic text that actually underpins the, the discrimination that, uh, that, that, that is happening uh, against Muslim women. Um, and so it's come up with this great resource called Men in Charge, Rethinking Authority um, in Muslim legal traditions. I highly encourage everyone uh, to look at it. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, like uh, within the region of, you know, Southeast Asia, uh, our neighbors, uh, Indonesia, uh, you know, in terms of um, Islam and feminism and, and you know, working with uh, and empowering uh, women, speaking with uh, authority, 
from the tradition of Islam that upholds uh, liberalism, pluralism. Um, you know, there, there, there is this movement um, to, to expand um, 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 these uh, notions of Islamic feminism. Um, and there was a launch last year of the uh, Congress Ulama Perempuan Indonesia, and they have actually come up you know, with uh, principles that not only look at the sources within the religious sources of Islam of um, Quran the Hadith, but they also look at um, international um, uh, instruments of CEDO. Um, they also um, uphold, you know, like uh, they, they, um, their, their constitutional guarantees, you know, what, what's within their pancha silal. And uh, they, they came up with a very, very good uh, three fatwas, one on the issue of child marriage, um, violence against women as well as protection of the environment. Um, and I think um, on the issue of child marriage, I think they are probably getting um, somewhere quite, uh, um, and, and, and we look forward to actually um, um, uh, following their lead in terms of uh, being able to uh, have a movement um, to end child marriage uh, within the region. Um, and finally, you know, we are at the exploratory stage. Again, you know, it's with the Indonesians. Uh, where there is this movement to talk about, um, uh, to engage uh, on the issue of gender equality, uh, but from the approach of reciprocity. Um, and this is to address those who are uh, from the religious backgrounds, who are open to the idea of diversity and pluralism, but somehow not on gender equality. Because similarly, you know, in Malaysia as well, we do have a lot of um, uh, young people who are, are grounded within a religious education, um, to a certain extent, they are actually open to, you know, engaging and being critical of Islam, being critical of the Quran, being critical of the systems and the structures uh, uh, that has to do with Islam in Malaysia, which is all great and good. Um, but when you ask them, you know, like, what's your position on polygamy? You know, do you agree with it? You know, they will not say, yeah, they, they, they disagree. So I think that, that, you know, when it comes to gender, somehow, you know, that male privilege, you know, still needs to be challenged. Um, and, but, you know, we hope that, you know, with our Indonesian counterparts, we hope to make headway into this. Thank you so much, Rosanna, for sharing that. It's really exciting also to hear particularly about the sort of cross-movement work that's happening uh, in the region and the ways in which women's networks are building on each other's successes and gains as well. Um, I think the question of engaging with religion is often a, a question people don't really know how to take it or where to take it when you're dealing with fundamentalisms, but it's really important to be able to track and see the progress that's been made through doing that and the links, as you were mentioning, right? So working with the CEDAW committees, working with national legislation to, pr to pr pr create progress around reforms, um, and also then the education and, and space, this democratic space this makes, really. I think what you're articulating is such a powerful route to reviving a, what is being shut down through threats and violence, an idea of discourse and debate and conversations to be had around where authority is. Thank you so much for that. Um, Christina, I'd love to move to you next to have uh, you explore as well some of the resistance that you were mentioning to these movements um, and how those are changing in the shape of what you're facing now. Uh -huh. Well, I guess I'll just point out a few uh, lessons that we have um, that we have uh, uh, seen. Uh, in the many years that uh, the the civil society here in the Philippines has acted on on uh, the uh, difficult situations, um, one I think one main um, one main uh, lesson that we have learned is uh, that the battleground is everywhere. Uh, so when we talk of uh, tactics on on calling out uh, the co cooptation of language distortion of um, concepts, especially on women's rights and human human rights. I guess this has to be done in a more, in a comprehensive in a, and in a big way, because those who are fueling these forms of uh, distortion and co-optation are far bigger. You know? uh, they have far more resources than what we clearly have. So what we need is, uh, is a, is is uh, the readiness to um, do this kind of uh, uh, 
resistance uh, both online using the digital media in amplifying our messages, in amplifying our positive uh, narratives. Um, and at the same time, more much needs to be done offline. So the parliament of the streets are, of course, still the primary um, uh, of primary importance in terms of uh, showing uh, uh, the the outright rejection of several government policies. But at the same time, this can also be done in several communities. For example, as in the case of uh, the strike of uh, workers of a Japanese corporation uh, in the Philippines in more than 10 uh, plantations, even under the most difficult circumstances of martial law that is existing down south in Mindanao here in, in the country. At the same time, offline means uh, that, that the battleground needs really to be anywhere, whether it's within the parliament, um, our progressive candidates should be, and political parties should be bold enough to uh, put forward candidates and uh, platforms um, in, in any election, both local and at the national level. And at the same time, uh, courts, is the the courts are uh, remains a battleground for many of us because of the many cases on impunity that we have uh, secondly the the lesson that we learned is that alliances are really very important you know so even um we have seen it in the case of uh the uh the the false charges of terrorism hit upon uh, the un special rapporteur on uh, indigenous peoples victoria tauli corpus and many other Filipino human rights defenders. No? And uh, it is with that example that we looked at the role of local governments, uh, the role of uh, churches, um, Catholic and Protestant churches, and even of businesses no? uh, in um, providing uh, necessary support for human rights defenders who are facing grave risks, no? like what have, uh, what Vicky and uh, several human rights defenders have faced when they were uh, facing uh, terrorism charges here. Uh, this also brings us to the third point where um, international movement building is really uh, becomes increasingly necessary, you know, um, because as what I've said, we are facing far uh, bigger um, monsters, so we say, you know. And uh, lastly, we think in our experience, we think that both organizing at the community level and education remains the bedrock of um, of movement building you know, at all levels, because uh, this cannot possibly substitute for um, the need to um, influence uh, uh, bigger sections of our populations uh, to go against this rising tide of fascism that besets us, um, especially in this part of uh, Southeast Asia. So um, resistance comes in different forms, no? and that is uh, especially with uh, many um, youth and students, uh, what they call the millennial generation or senior generation. I guess we th there is much need for young people to be engaged in social movements uh, to bring forward many innovations no, that we can still uh, employ in, um, in, in enhancing our strategies uh, in resisting uh, fascism and fundamentalisms. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, Chainaka? Yeah, so I, I'll actually <clears throat> go on from where Christina left. I think that in India, at the moment, there are two things that I see very, very much in parallel with what Christina said, in the sense that the repression is of a kind that we've not seen before. The kind of repression that we're seeing today against uh, who you would think are, were usual activists who are just raising the voice of dissent. Um, they're being put under laws that are really terrible. We have one law called the UAPA, which is unlawful activities prevention act and that's that has kind of emergency like powers in the sense that you have you cannot get bail for six months you cannot even ask questions 
So once you put under that, the state has complete power over what kind of incarceration that they're doing. And the last year, we have seen um, about 10, 15 people being arrested under that um, at different points of time. And I think that the country, uh, all movements together are working hand in hand to deal with this kind of repression because it's not possible for any one group to do that. Um, and in particular, so it's it's been a battle fought in the court, a battle fought in the streets, a battle fought on the net, a battle fought across countries, which is working in whatever ways possible, because these people who've been picked up are, there are women from the women's movements, there are uh, people who are working, um, who are academics, there are people who've been writing, people who've been, you know, various kinds of uh, urban activists have been picked up under this, workers have been picked up under this. So this has been something, this kind of repressive laws itself, which give this kind of uh, unparalleled power in the hands of the state, is something, is a battle that's across everybody. Uh, what, what one of the lessons that I would take from there is to say that uh, most of us have learned that we cannot do our battles alone. They have to be together. It is not possible to do it alone. Uh, what we're finding since it's now almost 40 years since this phase of the women's movements, what we find is that um, women's questions, questions of gender and sexuality have become integral to the question of other civil liberties, which was not the case 40 years ago. So that's the achievement of the women's movements and the voices that have been speaking for, for so many years, that the that caste, class, gender, sexuality, all of them are being articulated today in the same breath. They cannot be separate from each other. And so every movement is concerned about each of them. And the caste movements are the other ones that have been gaining a lot of dominant voice. And I think that they need to be foregrounded along with the class movements as much or even more maybe. So that's, that's the kind of coming together which gives hope. The second thing that has given hope in the last five years is the mobilizations across campuses, um, which is, you know, which is again phenomenal because uh, there, there is so much at stake at this moment for the marginalized student who is entering the campus that the only way that they can survive is through resistance. Uh, scholarships are being cut, seats are being cut, fees are being hiked in this scenario. And then uh, any kind of progressive voice of the student is being targeted. So we've seen that happening in campus after campus. And in the last four years, I think the biggest voice that came was from the students. And students have always taken a cohesive position on marginalizations. They've never taken you know, one voice over the other. It's not easy, but they're trying. And I think that that's a space of hope for all of us. Um, the third voice, which also has made itself heard much louder in the last few years is of agriculture, of the farm sector. So the farmers organizing themselves and actually coming from the rural areas to urban cities and talking about the issues because India is or has been an agricultural economy. And when att attention is not paid to this economy and attention is not paid to that sector of people, then there is a lot of... Uh, there is a lot of um, poverty that is at the rural level, which has led to rural urban migration, which has led to more urbanization, but which has also meant that there is a whole economy that is in doldrums and that needs to be addressed. So I think it's not, and then within the farmers also, the organizing of women as farmers, the organizing of women who've been now, uh, who've been left as the main farmers because the husbands have committed suicide. That's also a very large number of women. So the feminist voice then tries to articulate them not as widows of farmers, but as farmers themselves, and to bring women farmers issues also into the mainstream. So I and the last one, I think the most current one that happened in Bombay city was the bus workers strike. So you know, the, it is it is where the bus workers are actually talking of privatizing of the public bus service in the city. And consumers and travelers, the people who are going on those buses, trying to join hands with the workers' unions, 
to save the public transport system i i think that these these are what give us some sort of hope of what can work in terms of alliances the second thing that i would say is that uh, <coughs> i think there was a question on the me too also earlier which i missed answering uh, so the there were two rounds of me too in india one that coincided with the round that got prominence in the us which was last year um, which was just a list of people i list of names put out um, and there was much tension between the older feminists and the younger feminists over this method of calling out on sexual violence uh, the the recent recent round again has named many people some of against whom uh, some actions are being taken some actions are not being taken but i think what is important to note here is the fact that people are realizing that systems are not functioning that systems the the, the thing that uh, christina spoke of impunity impunity on issues of sexual violence that has stayed within every sector including the social sector to every academic space to every uh, house i think this is the voice that is being called out that if you're not going to address it then there is going to be a lot of noise around it which is something that we are seeing and finally what i want to say is that uh, the kind of coming together of feminist voices or women's voices that has become very complex in the indian situation and i i find it very positive that there is a challenge to mainstream feminism from other voices um and this challenge has been coming over the years it is not uh, new but i uh, what has emerged over the years is a leadership of those of from the margins of the women's movements and the feminist movements uh, so for example uh, the dalit women had raised many years earlier many two three decades earlier that the mainstream women's movement or what what was calling itself the mainstream i wouldn't want to call it the mainstream uh, what is being talked of as the women's movement is actually a very upper caste movement a very upper class urban movement and this has been uh, this has been addressed this has been taken note of this has been a point of discussion within the feminist movements which i see as a positive trend so it has been the dalit women it has been women from indigenous tribes it has been women from rural areas it has been single women and then it has been lesbian women i mean this has been a trajectory for a long time and each of these women from the women with disabilities women who work in sex work all of them have asked questions of who is this women's movements that is not representing us and so then the expansion of the women's movements and i use it in the plural all the time because i think that there are ways and ways in which people are organizing and i cannot be the voice representing them but there are many many pockets in which all of these are happening and so there is a losing and um, i almost erasure of something like the mainstream which i think is a very positive sign uh, that there is no one movement there are many movements and the last voice to be added to that has been of the trans people um that the fact that uh, there has been a community of trans people that is recognized or not recognized in the sense of recognized with rights but recognized with stigma within the society and that is mainly trans women who are hijras who are culturally organized in a particular way their presence has been there but they have been very stigmatized very uh, the society has been very violent towards them they have not been given any kind of jobs in the uh, regular society uh, that is one voice but over the last 10 years there has been a much larger voice of trans people uh, which is trans men trans women non binary trans people gender non conforming people all of them raising questions on actually gender itself and questioning the narratives of early feminism where gender was constructed and sex was biological so actually questioning that and then now coming to asking that how do we ask questions of how do we address gender inequality in this changed understanding of gender so i i think that the moment within india in that sense is very very positive that the questions of democracy that we are asking of the state are being asked of the movements themselves as well um and i think that doing this parallelly 
is crucial, critical, because we cannot now join hands all together and fight the larger enemy and keep the smaller enemies amongst ourselves. We will have to question our own uh, ways of putting down of each other or discriminating against each other or foregrounding certain issues and not foregrounding others. All of these questions have to be dealt with in the same manner if we want to address the larger questions outside. Thank you so much, Shayanaka. I couldn't agree with you more, I think, especially on that last point. It's really exciting to see and hear uh, the expansion of what we're calling women's movements and feminist organizing and really people who have been excluded within our own work um, coming to the forefront and taking the space that needs to be theirs uh, in order to be at the, the leading our movements really and leading us towards addressing those deep intersections uh, that perhaps we haven't been able to get to uh, so far but that we will not survive without. And I think, you know, something that struck me from both you and Christina was the importance of strikes. You know, as we've been talking about this and like the economic uh, system that's come up and, and the ways in which strikes are a method that hasn't necessarily been brought up or into traditional feminist organizing in those ways necessarily. Sometimes it has been, but I think there's a moment now where we're seeing more of this. There was a global women's strike. There's more movements happening to address that link between labor and the need to do this to preserve our public institutions and our public goods that are really collective goods um, in the process. Um, we have now about 20 minutes uh, for question and answers from the audience and a whole lot have come in from this last uh, set of interventions. So I'm gonna pose some of these to you all. Um, I'll take one round. So Rosanna, specifically to you, um, do you see conversations of resistance happening in the rural areas? Which groups of women are lead, leading these alternate engagement for enlarging democratic spaces in Malaysia? So I think linking to where we sort of ended just now with Chayanika, um, how are uh, different groups of women coming in? Um, there's another question which is uh, for everybody which is given the impunity and the threats and the harassment and the, and the violence, how do people respond? How do you respond um, to labeling, to character assassination, to so these other instances um, when speaking against all of these kinds of extremism, right? And, and how to balance that, I guess, in the resistance. Um, another question, um, in Africa, we are not only dealing with misogyny and hate, but also with patriarchy and male dominance. Um, are you in Asia still facing institutional patriarchy and male dominance? And so I guess Rosanna, maybe you can start since there was one specific question to you and then we'll go across. Oops. All right, okay. Um, Interestingly, I mean, the conversations or of resistance that we see happening, um, uh, and especially in relation to uh, the uh, resistance against um, the, the norms of patriarchy and male dominance, uh, especially within the, the private sphere, the family sphere, and the relations between a husband and wife, um, there is this particular um, uh, uh, Facebook page uh, that is dedicated uh, towards um, you know um, women speaking out and 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 all they want is actually the platform to be able to say that they dis they disagree um, uh, with 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 the norms and the practices and the expectations of you know being obedient to their husbands of um, you know being uh, suppressed uh, from you know uh, not being able to object to the practice of polygamy so all of these expressions are actually quite. Um, I, uh, it is there, but I think there's still that um, uh, underlying um, um, need uh, for that safe space because um, the um, the expressions that are coming across, uh, uh, you know, women, women, even rural women uh, in in Malaysia are quite um, interconnected, interconnected um, on mobile, um, and uh, however, um, I. I, I, the sense that I get is that they do not feel safe to actually come out uh, in public 
to express themselves in this way because it's still seen to be, you know, like challenging, you know, uh, to a certain extent, challenge, challenging uh, norms within religion. And that's not something that um, people can actually deal with very, very easily at the personal level because you are right, you know, there will be this, you know, backlash, threats of violence, name calling, character assassination um, 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 against speaking out. Um, uh, against patriarchy, against religion, against Islam. So, um, so for as long as uh, I, I think that there really needs a lot of uh, work to be done, um, you know, to reach out uh, to to women from all areas, uh, the rural areas, uh, the marginalized communities, even uh, within uh, urban areas as well. Um, so, you know, we're hoping to, uh, that, that one of the ways that we're actually trying to reach out uh, to the youth to be able to do this, because um, in a way, if, you know, they can reach out to, to their communities, then hopefully there will be more um, new platforms, new spaces uh, for women to come on board and have this, these kinds of engagement. Um, the other thing that we're also um, embarking on at the moment uh, is, a, is a national survey uh, to you know, understand how Malay Muslim uh, women actually understand um, equality, uh, whether they see equality, uh, gender equality is something that, that, that is actually um, accepted uh, within the framework of Islam. Um, and uh, we have only embarked on a qualitative uh, survey. Uh, we'll be uh, embarking on a quantitative survey soon. But uh, some of the feedback that came from that qualitative uh, survey uh, has been uh, uh, quite interesting in the sense that, you know, there, 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 there is that um, uh, resistance towards uh, uh, the, the, the norms and uh, the patriarchy that's happening within uh, the families uh, in particular. And they are actually, uh, women are actually finding more spaces of empowerment within the employment uh, sector, within the education sector, where they feel that they can be more of themselves, where they actually have a voice to be able to uh, uh, you know, disagree, and, and and they can see as well, you know, like to a certain extent, you know, in terms of qualifications and competence, they are actually to, uh, there are some um, uh, who feel that they can do um, as good or better than the men uh, around them. But when it came to the private sphere, when they go back to their families, you know, their voices are, are suppressed all over again. So I think, you know, there needs to be more work done um, on the ground by Sisters in Islam, especially unpacking um, all the work that's done by Musawa in relation to um, this whole notion of authority, how we, can we actually unpack and, and reinterpret and, and apply it within the current context of today, you know, that whole notion of, you know, uh, women are the one who are the providers and the protectors of the family and not so much the men anymore. Uh, because they are the ones uh, who are either uh, are in employment uh, or if both are in employment, you know, chances are, you know, it's also the women who are actually earning a lot more than the men. So these are some of the um, 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 challenges. Um, and uh, I actually look forward to be able to um, have these surveys uh, uh, completed and done and be able to share it with all of you in a eight hours. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rosanna. Uh, maybe we'll move to Christina. Yes, I'd like to address uh, the question of uh, on the response to threats uh, to violence. I guess uh, the first thing that we 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 should do, we should have been doing, is um, is number one to make these perpetrators accountable because win or lose no? win or lose meaning all spaces available for for um, redress um, should be uh, provided and should be encouraged at all levels because as long as nobody gets to own up to what they've do, been doing uh, against even for the minor threats that they they they, they issue against uh, women human rights defenders um, the point is we should make them accountable and that's 
uh, that's that's part of what we say to um, the the beneficiaries of our projects, our fellow members of various organizations, and and that should be on top of what uh, the, what we should do in terms of countering uh, these narratives and um, these forms of stigmatization against us. The second is the promotion promotion of uh, positive positive narratives, not so much on uh, the individuals, mm -hmm. but perhaps on the importance of the movements that we um, represent or the movements that we work on mm -hmm. and the issues that we work on. We should delve more on uh, the the um, the fruits of our struggle, so to speak, uh, whether these are this this have this has resulted to um, concrete gains in 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 trade unions or laws in in parliament or um, in higher wages or for agricultural workers. I think these victories, these small victories, uh, need to be highlighted to emphasize the need for collective actions. And uh, lastly, um, we, we should always take care of uh, what we um, usually neglect, you know, the kind of uh, physical and digital security that women human rights defenders need to be more aware of, uh, especially with uh, the um, consistent use of technologies, the digital media um, uh, to harass and to threaten um, uh, human rights defenders, but more more so women, you know, because of the gendered uh, uh, forms of uh, language that have been used um, uh, against uh, women human rights defenders. So I guess what what is important in countering uh, this, these forms of labeling is that um, we should rely more on the communities you know, that we have and in that way uh, we can devise more um, creative forms more appropriate forms in in our specific context and as for the existence of institutionalized patriarchy i guess um in the context of the philippines uh this is still very much entrenched you know? uh, while the catholic church has taken a back seat you know, in terms of um, political uh, influence the past few years because uh, the pre President Duterte also spurns the church, you know, given their, um, their, their they, they still have political power, they still have political influence, no? but at the same time, we cannot also uh, neglect you know, what Chayanika uh, uh, has been saying that there are there are differences no in opinions that we have um differences with regards to um the right to seek an abort to the right to divorce the right uh, the reproductive rights um uh the rights of the lgbt communities these are constant issues of debate with the catholic church here in the philippines and those are issues that we need to work on uh with them you know? um as uh, the church remains uh, very much part of uh, that um, of those institutions that promote patriarchy. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, Chayanika, if you have uh, your thoughts on those questions. So a couple of things I think uh, on the question of patriarchy and uh, Male dominance, I, I don't think that that's gone away anywhere. I mean, if there is, if there is misogyny, then it, obviously there is patriarchy along with it. Uh, the most recent example that I'm seeing and the strange way in which it plays out is this whole story that has been going on in this country right now. Uh, there are certain temples which did not allow entry of women in them because they were only for men. And some women went and challenged that and went to the Supreme Court and got a judgment in their favor when the Supreme Court said that this is discriminatory and it should not be allowed. And so then this is uh, in a state in um, southern India, which is in Kerala, where the state government is of the left government 
is in the control of the left government and very much against the right wing government that is in power in the country uh, so now this this site women are actually trying to enter that site and there is a whole whipping up of anger against them uh, and protests which are not allowing them to enter the temple and so one day one two women managed to enter and the priest then cleaned up the whole place and sanitized it because polluting women had entered this place so this is the nature of and and there's still there's this still a live issue uh, women are still trying to enter there is protest across the country there was a huge women's chain that was made in the different parts of the country to say that we believe in equality and we believe in non discrimination and that women are going to stand up for it everywhere so this support has been there there is lots of resistance but at the same time entry into the temple is not being allowed and they just men standing there protesting and not letting women come in so i i think patriarchy has many forms i mean some of this is obvious and the active resistance of this nature the other is more subtle more inbuilt and more systemic which actually makes us imbibe it in ways that we do not even see certain systems and methods as patriarchal so so even if we are looking at um, i mean I'm, as a queer activist i constantly feel that we don't engage with marriage in the same manner we don't see as marriage and family made out of marriage as necessarily being patriarchal and necessarily being a damaging institution for the whole society as such but those those are the kinds of debates that we still need to have with various civil society actors who may all together be opposed to this kind of obvious repressal or repression of rights but at the same time are also carrying forth carrying forward with us certain heteronormative and patriarchal understandings of society and letting them be so i i think that the battles are at different levels with different people um as far as the question of threat and impunity i i don't think we have an answer to it yet and apart from what christina said that we have to constantly ask for redressal to constantly ask for removal of that impunity in the smallest and the largest of cases but it is becoming more and more difficult it is becoming more and more challenging it is becoming um, more and more violent and um, one doesn't know how to address that one doesn't want to say that be brave and face it because that's not what we want we want people to be safe and secure we don't want them to face this constant online violence which is like uh, because the social media has been totally taken over by the right wing in india i don't know what the situation is elsewhere so you you have the you have paid trolls actually going around putting their messages everywhere you have lots of messages coming on whatsapp lots of uh, forwards that are coming which are all false you can constantly put out counters to it you can constantly put out alt facts but uh, the the way in which it goes and i i think that the one of the most challenging things in addressing all of this is how do you use reason and rationality to actually argue when everything is on the basis of emotion that's something that we're not able to get a handle on and as much as as feminists we don't see the divide between rationality and emotion we still feel there is something very lacking here that you're actually picking on insecurity of people and that kind of emotionality which is not what we are talking about so you know it's the taking over of language uh, that why should you think logically but no i when it comes to certain things and facts and figures then there has to be some accountability some sense of knowing that when the state says something and the state is lying how do i tell you that the state is lying so the state the, the prime minister of the country says that we have not taken any loans since we have come to power how am i to go and tell people that he is lying it's it's something that we are not able to understand and the same thing holds with the nature of stigmatization and the ways in which trolls go on about individuals that you know pulling out individual lives talking about individual lives and we don't know how to counter it so i i i actually don't think we have an answer to the first question thank you chayanaka i think uh, 
there's so much work, yes, that we need to do across our different contexts to figure out exactly what are these new forms of uh, oppression and violence that we're seeing against us. I think, you know, the public space of the internet is a huge one, and it has been brought up in some of uh, your discussions today and your interventions, and I think it's a whole can of worms that uh, we can explore, and maybe that'll be in a follow-up. Um, but I do just want to thank um, all of the panelists uh, for joining us today. We are here um, sort of nearing the end of the webinar. Um, this was really insightful. Um, there's a lot of bleakness in some of the situations that we're facing and to really make that space and to hold that weight together I think is really important. But there has also been uh, so many inspiring examples of how we are building alliances and whether that is nationally, how we are bringing in actors who we wouldn't necessarily see as traditional allies, how the central tenets uh, of gender and sexuality have expanded um, and come into other movements, whether that's around economic justice, whether this is around forced migration, whether this is our climate impact, environment and land grabbing, and, and how we really can understand the gendered nature of that. And I think also um, what's been exciting has been the discussions around youth as well and the power of the youth movements, and in some ways, the ways in which youth are a little bit more coalesced around some of these questions. Um, and so we're able to present and take forward, hopefully, um, a more unified front um, to some of these struggles, uh, so long as we continue to bring them into our movements. Um, I want to just close by uh, thanking again uh, my co-organizers, uh, Awid and Musawa, for the webinar. I wanted to invite uh, the audience as well. Thank you so much for your participation, for staying with us, for the questions and the engagement. Um, I'd like to let you know that um, ours as an initiative, um, the second report uh, from the group is coming out later this year. Um, and we are keen to invite uh, folks who are doing similar work, uh, who are doing this analysis, who are doing this monitoring, and who see a way to connect with us and to inform that, um, to get in touch with us. There is, for example, a report that's come out just recently by JAS, Just Associates, called Between a Rock and a Hard Place, um, which is also exploring very much these trends and links in the Southeast Asia region uh, around the issues of extractivism, these multinational corporations, around neoliberal policies, and very concretely how different groups uh, are coming together to, to resist those forces and what needs to be done to grow that support. And so if there are other such uh, resources, please get in touch with us uh, through the HOURS website, which once more is www.hoursplatform.org. And finally, I'd really appreciate it if uh, everyone on the call would take two minutes to complete the survey evaluating the webinar which will appear automatically uh, once we log off. So thank you again, good evening, good night, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>